Hello, listeners. Welcome to episode 800. Yay! <laughs> Fireworks. <laughs> Glitter. Uh, this is it, listeners. It's episode 800. Welcome. Here we are. It's episode 800. It's a big occasion, isn't it? It is, isn't it? It's a big occasion, but the emphasis here is on chill, okay? In this episode, we're just going to chill together and celebrate episode 800. So let's let's sit back, relax, and enjoy podcasting together. Now, this episode might take absolutely ages. I don't know how long this is going to be, but we're not going to worry about that or anything else in this episode. No concerns and no worries at all, okay? For this one, I thought that I would answer some questions from listeners on social media, YouTube and my website. I recently asked for questions and I got loads, like billions of questions. I got literally billion, nine billion questions. And I'm going to try and answer almost all of them in this episode. Almost all of them, he says, correcting the text for the episode. I'm going to try and answer almost all of the questions in this episode. By the way, this little intro bit is scripted and you can find the script for this first part on my website or you can see it on the video version of this if you're watching the video version. You might have noticed. But the rest of the episode, the vast majority of the episode will be unscripted and I'll just sort of be uh, speaking spontaneously. Okay, so billions of questions. I'm going to try to answer almost all of them in this episode. That might be seriously overambitious and this could end up being the longest episode ever. We will see. If I have to divide it into parts, so be it. We've had episode 300, part one and part two, if you remember, as well as several episode 666s. There's 666 part one, two and three. So we can have episode 800 in a few parts if it's necessary. But in fact, that does uh, that does prove that I've already done more than 800 episodes, doesn't it? Because there was 300 parts 1 or 2, 666 parts 1, 2 and 3 and others. Um, in fact, I reckon it's over 1,000 if you include the premium ones, the bonus ones, the app-only ones, the phrasal verb ones. It's got to be more than 1,000. In any case, I'm going to try to go through the questions uh, that Lepsters have sent to me and try to answer as many as possible. This is bound to take bloody ages I mean, hours. It could take hours. We'll see. So I've chosen nearly all the questions which came to me, except for World Cup, uh, except for World Cup questions, because I'll probably talk about that in another episode. Uh, the questions are presented here in no particular order from various social media platforms, and I'm going to correct errors if and when I find them. So this will be a sort of error correction episode two, I expect. We will start in just a minute, but first. I just wanted to take this moment to celebrate getting to 800 episodes. 800 episodes. Okay, listeners. All right, listeners. How are you doing? You all right there in podcast land? It's grey and cold here. Very grey and very cold. I've got loads of different lights on in my pod room. I've got a light in front of me. I've got a sort of blue light behind me and various other lights. I'm desperately trying to feed the room with light so that the video looks looks reasonable. I don't know. I hope the video looks all right. Anyway, we'll see. So 800. Uh, What does this really mean to me? Well, I suppose really it's just this podcast has become a sort of long-term professional project, which has actually been a success and which continues to be. I mean, I've no, I've, I've never ever done a project, uh, as long as this, uh, at this kind of level for, you know, in my life. Um, so I think it's no mean feat that I've managed to keep it going. And also 800 is just a nice big number, isn't it? It's just a nice large number. Um, and, 800, really, when you think about it, is is a massive amount of anything, isn't it? Just name a thing and imagine 800 of it. It's almost always a lot. Like just anything at all, like pairs of scissors. 800 pairs of scissors. If I had 800 pairs of scissors in this room, I might not be able to, to actually do any work because the scissors would just be everywhere. I mean, 800 anything, 800 cars, for example, that's... That's like a whole car park full of cars or several car parks. I mean, 800 is a lot. So it's satisfying to reach a milestone. But now I have my sights on episode 1000. That would be 
special, right? Uh, 1,000 is coming fairly soon. I mean, if I do about what? Let's say, give or take, I'd probably do about one episode a, uh, a week, let's say. So plus the premium ones, but then they don't get counted in the in the numbers. Uh, so if it's one episode a week, it's about 50 episodes a, a year, maybe. So that's, I'm about what? What's that? Four years away from episode 1,000? Is it that far? Anyway, there's no need to dwell on this too long. No need to talk about reaching 800 episodes too long. It's just a number. It's like it's like aging when you get to 40 years old. I mean, you know, you're as old as you feel, really, aren't you? And so, um, anyway, thank you, though. Thank you to you for continuing to listen to this podcast and for allowing me to keep doing this all these years. Also, recently, the podcast hit 100 million downloads. That's a that's a total 100 million downloads in total since the podcast started. So nice one, guys. I love doing this podcast and I hope that you love listening to it too. Why did I say it like that? I don't know. But I love making this podcast and I love the fact that I can do this. I can spend most of my time working on uh, making content for learners of English, doing it my own way, being my own boss. And it's all thanks to the podcast, which means uh, a lot. And it also means that it's all thanks to you. And the way it works is that basically those people who can afford to become premium subscribers, uh, they can do so. And they get the premium content and ad free episodes and stuff. Uh, those people who can afford to sort of support me can do that. And that ultimately keeps the show completely free for everyone else. Those people who maybe can't afford to, uh, you know, support the podcast in some way. And uh, so everyone gets content and I get to keep making these episodes, which is what I love doing. So there it is. So now then, thank you, basically. Thank you for keeping the podcast alive. So let's get on with the listener questions. Let's get stuck in there with the uh, with the listener questions now. Okay. And and by the way, I think I said this, did I? I've removed all the World Cup questions because I think I'm going to talk about that in a separate episode. Okay. So World Cup is going to be, I'm going to talk about that in another episode. Um, so here we go with questions from Lepsters. Here we go. Questions from Lepsters. So these are questions from YouTube. So the first one is from Cyril Alexander. And Cyril said this, Hello, thank you for this Lux podcast. I saw you like playing guitar and maybe you have your own compositions and maybe you have some thoughts about your own rock band. Luke, did you ever dream to be a rock star? And would you ever, uh, would you be able to wear the rock star burden? Um, any corrections necessary? Maybe should be one word here. Uh, maybe, maybe, maybe you have some thoughts. Did you ever dream to be, dream to be a rock star, dream of being, dream of being a rock star. Yes, playing guitar, maybe you have your own compositions, maybe you have some thoughts about your own rock band. Did you ever dream of being a rock star? Would you be able to carry the rock star burden? Um, so, all right, so, um, <laughs> yeah, I used to play in bands. I was in lots of different bands. Uh, this is before I started the podcast, really. Uh, lots and lots of bands. And I was very serious about music for a while. I played the drums. And I was in, I mean, I made a list of the bands I was in here. Um, one, two, I think it's 12 bands. And maybe half of those bands were quite serious. So the first band I was in was called Grandpa Knuckles. Grandpa Knuckles. That was the name of the band. It was a punk band that my brother was in. And they had a bass player and he 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 left for some reason. They lost him. So they needed a bass player. So I stepped in. I was 15 years old. Uh, I had sort of like curtains, you know, that kind of haircut from the 90s where it's a center parting and the hair goes down. Kind of like, like Hanson, you know, like Mbop. I looked like that, but my hair was a bit shorter. And uh, so I played bass for them. And so my first experiences of live music were playing bass on stage with Grandpa Knuckles. Our lead singer had a huge Mohican haircut and everything. And we used to play very heavy punk music. And then after that, I got into my own band with um, some of my friends, including Jake, who is the daughter of Megan Davies, who I interviewed. She was the bass player who was in a pop band in the 60s. So I was with uh, Jake and some others in a band called Skellington. Skellington is the word that a child 
would say when they want to say skeleton, but they can't say skeleton, so they say skellington. So we called ourselves Skellington. And we were a, uh, a punk funk band, which means that we played kind of like funk music, but quite badly, basically. And we played the college band's concert, which was a big moment. So at Sixth Form College, which is like a school, but everyone's 16 to 18 years old. Um, and at the end of the first year, there was a concert in the uh, the main sort of, uh, what do you call it, sort of common room of the college. And there was a stage put up and stuff. And the bands at the college all performed songs, you know. There was a big gig. And there were lots of bands at college. And so we practiced and practiced and we did our stuff. And it was a total smash. It was brilliant. And we did we did sort of like instrumental funk music. We also had a singer and lots of wah-wah and Hammond organ and stuff. It was really good. But we didn't really go anywhere. Um, the band sort of fell to pieces in typical fashion. Very sort of spinal tap, really. I was also in a band around the same time called Flat Badger. Um, and we were a sort of a jam band in uh, the garden house in my at my place because we had this garage that was separate from the house and we had the drum kit set up in there and and we had electricity in there so we could plug all the amplifiers in and we used to practice there so that was a, a band i was in with some guys from college then after high after skellington there was hyper sound which was our kind of brit pop band basically we again with jake from skellington Jake was a great songwriter and he came up with lots of really good songs. And with Hypersound, we were quite serious. We used to practice all the time and we uh, recorded several demos as well, including one in a in a sort of professional recording studio in Birmingham. But again, didn't go anywhere, unfortunately. After that, I was in a band at university and we were called Orson. That's not awesome, like, oh my God, that's awesome but Orson, like Orson Welles, which is exactly what I had to say every time I told anyone the name of the band. It's like Orson, but not like Orson, but Orson Welles, you know. And uh, we used to play lots of gigs in Liverpool. I played at the Cavern Club, the famous Cavern Club in Liverpool, uh, on stage playing the drums, although technically it's not exactly the same Cavern Club as the one the Beatles used to play in because that was smashed down to make way for a underground train line. But they recreated the Cavern Club pretty much next door. So I did do a, a show there and we also won a number of competitions. We were quite a good band, again, quite serious. Um, we recorded a demo in a a professional studio in Liverpool. We went to London. I went with the guitarist and singer and we went around, schlepped around London, giving out our demo tape to all the record companies. We heard absolutely nothing in response to any of them. And uh, after we decided to just leave Liverpool, that was the end of the band. So that was awesome. Then um, when I came back from university and went back to the Midlands uh, near Birmingham, I got into another band with Jake again. And uh, the band with Jake was called Ute Club, which is kind of like, I guess it means youth club, but it's a certain way of saying it. Ute Club, not youth club. So anyway, Ute Club, we were a sort of, um, we were a bit like the Happy Mondays or Black Grape or something like that, maybe Primal Scream, sort of um, dance music with samples and stuff, but with live instruments as well. And we did loads and loads of shows in Birmingham. We made recordings. We were on TV in, in London and stuff. And we tried our best. But I, was not, I, I wasn't feeling it at the time. And I wasn't in a very good place at the time. Sort of, I didn't feel very happy. And that was just before I went to Japan. And after I'd been in Ute Club, I trained to be a teacher. And then I went off to Japan. I also played at the same time in another band called the Jake Bullet Band, again with Jake. And uh, we did sort of versions of all his songs because he had some other songs that he'd made for another album, which was like a studio album, but we decided to make a live band out of it. And we did lots of gigs with, with the Jake Bullet Band as well. I, d I can actually play you some samples. I mean, this, I said before, this episode is gonna be ridiculously, um, ridiculously long, okay? So let's just relax and not worry about that. Um, <clears throat> this was the demo. This was the demo of Ute Club, um, the guys I was in a band with in Birmingham before I went to Japan. So this is not me playing, but this is an idea of what it was like. This is just the demo, okay? Which means a rough version of the song before you then do it properly.
This track is called Sleepy Monday. So this is where I would be playing the drums normally. So there you go, that's you, Club. Now this was the band I was in when we used to play, because we had a backing track, like these sampled loops, I used to have to try and play exactly in time with the loops, and we tried every single way possible. We played a, a click track in my ear. Uh, there was a click track in my ear, and uh, I had to try and play along to that, but I couldn't hear it because the music was too loud. And then we tried playing the music in my headphones, but that didn't work because I couldn't hear that. In the end, we got a huge monitor speaker and put it on a table next to my drum kit and blasted the backing track out of the speaker right into my ears. I think I've probably destroyed my hearing from doing that. I expect later on my hearing will fall apart or something. Uh, but I, it was just white noise that I was trying to play along to. It was terrible. Um, but anyway, there you go. This is Ute Club. Am I drumming on this? I think, you know what? I actually might be drumming on this. Because there's a live drummer there, right? I think I am drumming on this. What about some of the others? I don't remember, to be honest, if I'm drumming on that or not. But anyway, that was Ute Club. Then I went to Japan, right? And I, and I remember uh, when, I, when I first arrived, I was talking to one of my colleagues. We were just like fresh, freshly arrived. And I had no sense of how I could ever integrate into Japanese life or culture in some way. And I remember sort of looking at a guitar shop in a street in Paris with one of my colleagues and sort of daydreaming and going, oh, I'd imagine I'd love to be in a band in Japan with some Japanese guys. And my colleague was like, well, you totally can. But for some reason, it was like totally impossible for me that I would ever get that sort of um, involved in life there. But of course I did. And I was in a band called Kilimanjaro. And that was a sort of like a shoegazer sort of uh, indie rock band. Uh, with a couple of Japanese people, um, one of whom was called Yusuke, Yusuke Namoto, and the other one is Azusa, but I don't remember her surname. And I got an email from her. I hope that if she, Azusa, if you're listening to this, I hope you don't, I hope you don't feel uh, awkward about me mentioning you, but uh, you sent me an email and I replied to you. So I hope you're doing really well. It was nice to hear from you. Uh, so anyway, Kilimanjaro, that was a very nice band and uh, like a like three piece. And um, as I spoke, really good English. Yusuke was like totally silent the entire time. But then once I went to McDonald's with him and suddenly poof, he started speaking English. I was like, where does, where does all that English come from? Um, later on, we, with uh, Yusuke, uh, we kind of did another band called Lure, L-U-R-E, Lure, and actually recorded a couple of tracks and got them released. So they were released and available in the shops. Um, the CD was in the shops. You could buy it in Japan. It was a compilation CD of various sort of local bands, um, uh, and it was like an indie kind of thing. So yeah, I was actually, uh, I did drum on a track that was released in the shops. I can play you the song. It's it's called Fanfare, or in Japanese, that would be Fanfare, I think. Anyway, so this is it. This is Lure. This is me on drums, Yusuke on guitar and vocals, and a couple of friends as well. Um, all right, let's play that. Here we go. Sort of think Stone Roses, Manchester kind of vibe, but in Japan. Such a very sweet song. I really, really like this song. It's lovely. I, 
remember the recording session for this very well. Great memories, I have to say. It brings it all come it all comes flooding back. Oh, some nice vocal harmonies. Isn't it? It's lovely. I really, really love that. I've got some very, very nice memories of uh, recording that. I remember when we, we, we went into the studio, we set up all the stuff, and we did a, a run through of this song. Right? That's where you just practice it. And our, our run through was perfect. It was like better than this. The run through was amazing. But of course, it didn't get recorded, which is what always happens. So we did it again instantly. It was somehow slightly not quite as good, but it still sounds nice. So anyway, that's that's Lure. So, I mean, this is still the first question. I've been talking for ages just for this first question. I'm going to try and do it quick fire for a lot of the other questions, though. So that was Japan. Also, with Yusuke, I got into... We, the two of us did a little project together where I played the drums and the bass, he played the guitar, and then I did the vocals. And we did some sort of four-track recordings like that. And it was the, the, the idea was it was kind of like a punk ethic, like a punk mod British sort of mod revival kind of thing. Okay? so And very much like Keith Moon influenced. Here we go. That's me on the drums. Just tell me what to do I'll do it to you Just Check out my drumming skills I need to do I don't want to watch the news Okay, so that's <laughs> that's what that's like um, Never did anything with that But still, it's quite fun to have it Also, when I was in Japan I ended up in a sort of a jazz funk band <laughs> uh, the, the band was called The Radicals and they were based in the Kamakura, no, in the, yeah, Kamakura area of, of uh, Kanagawa Prefecture in Japan near the sort of Shonan Beach sort of thing. And yeah, it was like a jazz funk band with uh, my friend Brett on saxophone from Australia and then all the other guys in the band, the keyboards, guitar, bass, drums. I played percussion and also they persuaded me to sing a couple of songs which was quite fun and i've got some evidence of it on youtube have a look at this <laughs> okay so there i am standing there <laughs> so this is what 2003 oh my god so look at me, I'm standing out so uh, I'm, I'm like way taller and so much whiter than an, almost everyone else on stage. I don't quite know what to think when I look at this. <laughs> it's quite embarrassing. But I was having a fantastic time, you've no idea. So, <laughs> okay, playing percussion in a in a funk band in a jazz cheesy jazz funk band was kind of always one of my dreams and so although that's a little bit embarrassing to look at it was actually amazing fun and a great opportunity to actually do something i'd always dreamed of doing so uh that was the radicals then when i came back to london uh, my brother moved to new zealand and of course the band he was in needed a drummer and that was a punk band so i ended up in salvo i did an episode about salvo years ago i don't remember the number 
uh, but it's the story of Salvo, and it's a drunken conversation with some with the members of the band. And Salvo was a hardcore punk band, right? So from funk to punk and back again, uh, hardcore punk band. And we were again really serious. We practiced every week, and um, we did loads of gigs in London. We recorded a demo. We shipped the demo around everywhere. We got nowhere again. I mean, how many times has that been that with bands that I've tried and failed to get anywhere? <laughs> uh, but anyway, I'll give you a taste of 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 Salvo. Me on drums, Aaron on bass and vocals, and Chris on guitar and vocals. Go. This one is called Cust Customs, and the lyrics are good. I might have to skip forward a little bit, but anyway, here we go. See, quite heavy music. See, it's kind of influenced by a lot of American hardcore punk music from the 80s and 90s. Check out the lyrics, they, they're good. Here's a question custom asked What you got inside your hand? Is it something we could have? Will it make the world turn round? They overpay for it, but keep on taking it It's overrated, but the body gets no return It gets sliced by the knife that you wave around Calling the favour, but the product is stuck in Try repeating nothing, we should have done something When you such a needle in, I didn't remember it then You come back to us Okay, you get the idea I'm not sure everyone's going to be a fan of that, but that's just an idea. I mean, the, this this track here, this is the last one I'm going to play, is like, uh, I had to basically play as fast as humanly possible, right? You hear when I, my drums come in, the whole song speeds up, which is not really a good sign, but I'm trying to play as fast as I can. Not bad, right? Yeah, I actually love that. That was amazing. But um, so that's kind of like the last serious band I was in, really. Uh, other than that, I was in um, I was in the school band at the school I used to work in, the London School of English. We had a band. We used to practice every week, and we did lots of cover versions of like sixties and seventies uh, songs and things. And we used to do. Uh, shows at school parties so every sort of few months there'd be a, a big party at the school and we would perform for like two hours or so and we would because we play for so long and we were the music it was great to see people dancing people like really dancing to our music and that was always good and I was in a band with my cousin Ollie called Sick Rock and we did cover versions for birthday parties and stuff like that and I played bass and sang in that one so there you go those are all the bands I've been in uh, with limited levels of success. Also, I've, I've made lots of my own music too. Uh, no need to go into that any further. Right, so I've been talking for half an hour and I think that was just the first question. I mean, that was a big question for me, but still half an hour on the first question. We need to speed up in a big way because how many? there are 95 pages in this document. So we could be going for ages. Maybe this is going to be like a four-part series or something. I don't know. Anyway, let's carry on. So uh, Engshan, this is English with Zishan, wrote this. He said, hey, Luke, my name is M. Zishan. I'm from Pakistan. I'm your big fan. So could you explain us? We don't normally say explain us. Normally just could you explain. Could you explain the difference between these sentences? Okay, a bit of language stuff. All right, then. So the differences between these sentences. First one is this. We had to stay until we had finished our podcast. We had to stay until we had finished our podcast. And the second sentence, we had to stay until we finished our podcast. So it's basically past perfect in the first one, until we had finished, and past simple in the second, until we finished. Which, what's the difference? 
There's a very slight difference. Uh, Zishan is also asking which one is correct. They're both correct. They just mean slightly different things. So in the first one, we had to stay. Let's let's deal with the second one first. We had to stay until we finished our podcast. So here's the timeline. Okay. Here is uh, the podcast, 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 podcast. Okay. All of this is in the past. And um, so this is also uh, have to stay, have to stay, have to stay. Right. And uh, the have to stay continues for the same length as the podcast. So when the podcast finished, we could go. Right. The same moment the podcast finished, that's when we could go. We had to stay until we finished our podcast. Now, the other one is we had to stay until we had finished our podcast means that. Um, hmm. OK, so there's here is a point which is we finished our podcast. And then after that, even briefly after that, it's here we we had finished our podcast at this point. Now, the finishing of the podcast happened before. Right. This moment. That's why we say had finished. So we, f we, we had to stay until we had finished. That means we had to stay until after we finished the podcast. So that is probably slightly later. So the first one, we had to stay until we finished. That means the moment we could go was the moment the podcast finished. The other one, we had to stay until we had finished is after the moment the podcast finished was when we could go. All right. So that's the, the purpose of, of had finished. It shows that the action, in this case finished, happened before. So it puts a bit of, it just shows that that's completed. So when the thing is completed, then after. I mean, the, 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 the meanings are almost exactly the same. It's just that when we had finished refers to after we finished, even if it's just a moment after. So the sentences are both correct. They mean almost the same thing, not, but not quite. I mean, another example of this is like, you know, when I arrived at the party, everyone left. And when I arrived at the party, everyone had left. Uh, the first one is, I arrived, then everyone saw me and go, oh God, Luke's here, let's go. When I arrived, everyone left. And the other one is, they left before I, I arrived. When I, when I arrived, everyone had left means that they left before I arrived. Okay, let's move on. Uh, Sarah, Sarah Bende. I think, said this. Hi, Luke. Thanks for this mini episode. Congratulations on the 800 episodes. My question is, if you are considering to have more rambling episodes. Actually, we would say if you are considering having, because it's consider doing. Consider is followed by an ING. My question is, if you are considering having, doing, or actually, doing more rambling episodes, because they are fun. Right, it should be, there's, there's no full stop there. And that, let's make that because, because they're fun. And I think it is, <laughs> and I think it is an excellent way to learn how to speak naturally and talk about daily life. Looking forward to seeing, not looking forward to see, but looking forward to seeing more rambling episodes. So basically, am I considering doing more rambling episodes? Yes, absolutely. Of course, I always want to do rambling episodes. Basically, the way that works is that um, I, uh, what am I talking about? as I correct my screen here, or at least try to. Yeah, I always want to do rambling episodes because the way it works is that I make my episodes, often I will sort of um, create these episodes, uh, edit them in advance, maybe conversations with guests or whatever, and I create them. And then I have a list of episodes which then get published. But then there are times when I just want to just sort of talk off the top of my head. I just want to be spontaneous and uh, sort of talk and then publish on exactly the same day without any kind of pause. You know, if I really want to keep everyone engaged. So then in those cases, then I'll just do a rambling episode, which don't normally require much, much preparation, those episodes. Um, and also it's a good way to just like get stuff off my head, off my chest. And I really like doing that. I like to just uh, speak and speak and let my mind spill out into words. And uh, I find it's quite of quite cathartic for me. So I'll always be doing rambling episodes, but they're not always going to be rambling episodes, but they're, you know, I, I will always do them. They'll just come, you know, fairly regularly every five, six, seven episodes, 10 episodes or something. Next comment, um, Maria Grazia Fornarotto. Maria Grazia Fornarotto. 
with my wonderful pronunciation. Hi, Luke. It's Mary from Italy writing. I was just wondering, who is your favourite contemporary English novelist and why? Thanks in advance for your reply. My favourite contemporary English novelist. That's that's kind of a tough one. I mean, I'm not a great reader. I'm not like my mum who reads and reads and reads brilliantly. But actually, one of my favourite authors, contemporary English one, is David Mitchell. Um, David Mitchell wrote, his most famous book is probably Cloud Atlas, which was turned into a film. But he's written other books like Number Nine Dream and Black Swan Green. And the, the one that the, the book that I've been reading at the moment is called The, the Thousand Autumns of Jacob de Zoet. Um, and uh, it's very interesting. It's about a Dutch uh, trader who ends up uh, in Japan. And uh, things get a bit complicated. It's during the sort of the, the period in Japanese history when they were basically completely closed off from the rest of the world. But this guy gets a sort of a unique chance to have a look inside the country um, working as a trader and he ends up sort of like getting caught up in some drama. Uh, but David Mitchell, um, I just love the way he writes, obviously, and he's got, he's just very, very evocative, very descriptive. Um, he's able to conjure a certain mood. Um, he writes a lot about Japan. There's always a Japanese connection, which kind of relates to, to my experience. So yeah, David Mitchell, I, I recommend his work. Uh, check it out. It can be very dense. It can be quite sort of, um, well, obviously quite literary and a little dense. And the, the, the books are often very long. But uh, if you can get into it, then I highly recommend it because they are wonderful books and wonderfully told stories. Um, Maria wrote this. Hello, Luke. Thank you for your podcast. Tell us, please, what stories do you tell your daughter? What are they about and which ones are her favourite? So I tell my daughter every single damn story I can think of, like literally all stories. <laughs> I don't think there's a story out there that I haven't told her. So obviously she gets bedtime stories. And for those, we've got books that are lying around, like all the Mr. Men and all the Little Miss books and all those Julia Donaldson books like The Gruffalo and The Gruffalo's Child and Stick Man and Zog the Dragon and all that stuff. So we, we read her stories every evening, both in French and in English. Um, so she she gets sort of like read stories in both languages. Uh, but then uh, at other times, for example, if we're on a bus or if we're walking along somewhere, she will demand stories. She'll say, can I have a story? And if you say no, she cries. And so you have to read it. You have to make up a story. So I've had to make up some incredibly long stories, timing them so that they perfectly coincide with the moment that we get home. Because if I say, and that's the end of the story before we got we've got home, then she gets all upset as well. I mean, she's a bit of a tyrant in that way, obviously. Uh, but um, so all sorts of stories. But she always wants stories about unicorns and dragons. And she wants she always wants a scary story. So she likes scary stories with unicorns and dragons. So there's me desperately, desperately trying to think of another scary story with a unicorn and a dragon. Um, some of the stories I've come up with have been amazing. I wish I'd recorded some of them. But most of them, to be fair, complete rubbish, I think. <laughs> um, all right, so let's move on. Oishi wrote this. 800 is a long way. Congratulations, Teacher Luke. I would like to suggest that it would be great if you could upload one storytelling episode per week. Is it too much? Because as a lazy learner, your storytelling can carry me to the end of the episode. Um, yeah, the story episodes are popular, aren't they? People like them. Um, I will continue to do the story episodes, but a bit like the rambling ones, it's not going to be every single time. If I did one story episode every week, then that would that's it. You know, that would be the podcast. It would basically become a storytelling podcast. Not necessarily a bad idea, but I love doing the variety. I, I really need that. I need to have the variety of episodes. Um, and that's for two reasons. So for me personally, it's just like, that's probably how I've managed to keep doing this for, for this period of time. For this length of time is that I can kind of do whatever I want and it's never boring and it's always a bit different and it's always a sort of a, a blank canvas for whatever I want to do and that keeps things fresh for me. I never get bored or tired of it in that sense. So it's always like a fresh thing and also for you uh, I think it's a good idea to hear all sorts of different types of uh, English being spoken not just stories or rambles but conversations 
and articles and, you know, all the various different episodes I like to do, breaking down comedy, explaining jokes and things like that. So, I, you know, I think it's really important, in fact, vital for the podcast that I keep it varied because, you know, some people say the story episodes are their favourites. Other people say it's the rambling episodes. Other people say it's the episodes with Amber and Paul. Other people say it's the Rick Thompson report. Other people say it's, it's episodes with my, with my brother or my mum. So everyone's got their own different favourites. So if I made the podcast only one thing, then I think it would lose something. I mean, sometimes the podcast is a little all over the place. It's a bit ramshackle. You don't know what's going to come next. Sometimes it seems a bit inconsistent. But for me, that is uh, an intentional thing. I always want something to be new and I want to keep you on your toes so you don't quite know what to expect each time. Um, I think that's been part of why the podcast has been a success is because I've allowed it to stay fresh in that way. So I will do story episodes regularly, but it's not going to be every single week. Uh, Janja or Janja Markovic. Hey, Luke, I really like what you do and I'm a fan of your sense of humor. I was wondering, as a kid at school, were you this type of guy who bravely says a joke loudly so that the whole class hears and giggles afterwards? Uh, yes, I was. I was that cheeky kid at school who would make jokes or say comments in the class and I'd make all the kids laugh and I'd get away with it. I would almost always get away with it. Often it's because the teachers wouldn't notice that it was me. They wouldn't realize it was me. And so I'd get away with it for that reason. Or because uh, the teachers would kind of not mind because I was actually kind of a nice kid, but I would make cheeky comments. Um, so yes, definitely. I was the, the, <laughs> the kid who did that sometimes. And do you feel that via humor, you make atmosphere, or make the atmosphere, in any place, like job, school, family, pre-Christmas, pre-Christmas hustle or pre-Christmas hassle? Hustle is when you're working, you're trying to gin, win deals and things, and hassle means inconvenience. I'm going to guess that you mean hassle, but maybe you mean hustle. Um, hassle, H-A-S-S-E, H-A-S-S-L-E. Uh, -S -S <clears throat> hassle is like inconvenience. So do you use humour to make the atmosphere more amicable and light-hearted? Yes, absolutely I do. Um, I really do. I, I can't help doing that. I have to use humour to try and sort of take the edge off the atmosphere to make things a bit warmer, a bit smoother and a bit more light-hearted and friendly. I love doing that. It's one of my favourite things. In fact, I like uh, making things humorous more than being serious, to be honest. Um, so yes and yes. Um, Janja or Janja. Uh, Maria C said this, hi Luke or hey Luke, congratulations on the 800 episodes. My question is if Jerry Seinfeld is one of your favorite comedians and if it was him or another one who inspired you. Yes, definitely Seinfeld is one of my favorite comedians and I thought about this and I, I narrowed it down to a list of five people who are my favorite stand-up comedians who I think have inspired me. So there's Steve Martin, Definitely. There's a concert video of Steve Martin live. I think it's 1980 or 1979 where he's in his white suit. He's got his white hair. He's playing the banjo. He's got all these props on the stage. And just his attitude and the fact he's making people in a stadium laugh by doing nothing in particular and just the general attitude that he would adopt uh, with each bit of his comedy just really, really caught my imagination and really inspired me. Jerry Seinfeld, because of the observational humor and the way he delivers uh, his lines just having that comedy voice bill hicks was always a huge um uh, comedian for me when i was growing up he did very edgy material uh, and political material but also he was just very funny he did different voices he did different accents and facial expressions um eddie izzard is a very big influence on me he had a kind of stream of consciousness approach to his stand-up uh, where it felt very loose like he was just sort of like expressing ideas that were just coming to him in his mind. Although actually it was a, it was a pre-prepared routine, but just the, the vibe of Eddie Izzard and the subjects he talked about in a sort of silly way was very captivating for me. And then Bill Bailey is the other one. And I did an episode about Bill Bailey once. He's a musical comedian. He does, he plays guitar and piano and he's very, very, very funny with it. And I love his musical comedy. So there you go. There are my inspirations, comedy-wise. Serg or Serge, uh, Boo Rao, Boo Row, 
Don't know how to say your name, sorry. Hey Luke, what's cracking? Thanks for your fantastic podcast. In my humble opinion, for the time being, it's one of the most fascinating podcasts in terms of immersing in British English and British humour. What do you mean, for the time being? <laughs> why, why did you say for the time being? Meaning, f at the moment, until I find a better one, Luke, yours is the best. I'm just joking, of course. Um, thanks for your comment. Um, uh, my question is, do you consider moving to somewhere from Paris in particular and from France in general? So sometimes with my wife, the two of us, uh, we consider talk, we talk about moving back to England and where we could go. And basically, uh, it's probably London, but it's very expensive. And, you know, there's the school situation with my daughter and all that stuff, my wife's work. How would we make the transition? So we do often talk about going back to England, but it would be difficult. And then we also talk about moving outside of Paris, uh, maybe to a region near Paris, just nearby, but just outside, because the house prices are much more reasonable there. You get a lot more space um, and access to green spaces and stuff like that. So we do talk about that sometimes. Uh, other than that, I mean, sometimes we float the idea of moving to Canada or something like that, which is quite a nice idea, but I don't really want to be that far away from my family. So not really. I think we're quite happy staying in Paris for the time being, but we will see. Uh, Living Italian Style with Nina on YouTube wrote this. Hi, Luke. Thank you. Thank you for your amazing job on your podcast. My question is, when will you release another episode of the Rick Thompson Report? Uh, so that's going to be fairly soon. I don't know when. Hopefully before Christmas, uh, Nina. Um, we've been waiting to see how Rishi Sunak gets on with his government. Um, and we're just sort of like having a little look and just seeing. Uh, we'll probably do something about Rishi Sunak and his government uh, and maybe the strikes that have been going on. We might do that uh, before Christmas or maybe I'll record it with dad during the Christmas uh, break. We'll see. Antin Kuntin, Antin Kuntin said this. Hi, Luke. First of all, you're doing a really great job. Thanks, Antin. My question is, are you talking normally like in your daily life or slower and clearer than usual so that we can understand? Thanks in advance for your answer. Um, I think for the most part, in general, I speak the same um, on the podcast as I do in my more, in my normal, 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 what? In my normal life. Mormon life. I'm a Mormon. Uh, no, I'm not a Mormon. <laughs> what are you talking about? So I think I talk pretty much the same as I do in my normal life. Um, more or less. Maybe I make a bit more of an effort so I think here are the ways in which I talk on the podcast. So maybe in the introduction to episodes, I will sometimes speak very clearly and try to make everything really easy to understand in the introduction, to just grab your attention, just to ease you into the episode. And then later on, um, maybe if I'm having a conversation with a guest, then you'll see me just talking naturally like I would normally talk to a, a, a human. Uh, who spoke English as a first language. So you'll just hear me speaking normally. But a lot of the time too, like now, for example, I'm speaking fairly normally. But then again, there is a certain sort of broadcasting voice that you put on when you've got the microphone switched on and you're recording. You do kind of go into broadcasting mode. You make things a bit bigger. Even when there's no video recording me, I will move my arms and I'll gesticulate. I learned that very early on in the podcast recording in my podcasting career. I learned that ages ago. I remember sitting on the sofa in my flat in West London with a laptop on my lap, because it was a laptop. That's what you do with a laptop computer. You put it on your lap. And um, and talking to the computer, I was only using the inbuilt microphone on the computer and gesticulating with my arms there on my own in the living room, because I really felt it helped me to make what I was saying stand out a lot more and make it more um, noticeable and so on. So yeah, there's a certain level of broadcasting talk going on. But when I'm in conversation with a guest, I'm speaking totally normally. Um, so there you go. All right, Antin Kuntin. Uh, Vafa Gulieva said this. Hi, Luke. I've got three questions for you. In your opinion, approximately how many words do you need to have in your vocabulary to be able to speak like you do in your ramble episodes? And is there an efficient method for determining the amount of vocabulary for a non-native speaker? Okay, so 
the way that I ramble in these rambling episodes, it's not just about vocabulary. It's also a certain mindset and a certain approach to being able to talk off the top of your head without stopping. So, I mean, you could try doing that in your first language and assess how you are doing it, you know, in your first language. And you might be able to see what your rambling skills are like then. And then you apply that to English and see if you can do the same thing. Maybe it's that you lack vocab. It could also just be a lack of practice and uh, just the ability to do it. I mean, I've been doing this for years. I've been teaching for over 20 years. I've been doing stand-up, you know, for 13 years. I've been doing the podcast for 13 years. That's a lot of talking. And so you learn to do it after a while. You learn how to string your thoughts together. You learn how to connect your ideas. You know, you learn how to convert the things that are going through your head into the words that are coming out of your mouth so that you are speaking and talking, which is the same thing. I mean, you're speaking and thinking at the same time which is a great thing about the rambling episodes because I do think that makes them more captivating because there's a sense of real-time communication going on where I'm expressing my thoughts real-time as I'm thinking um, and I think that does make it quite engaging. Reading from a text, you don't get that so much because the text has been constructed in advance and you're just trying to, trying to read it out. Uh, but with this, there's my thought process going on as well and so I think that does help to lock you in. Uh, but anyway, vocab, if you're interested in vocab, there's a website called manylex.com, M-A-N-Y-L-E-X. Maybe that's manylex, M-A-N-Y-L-E-X.com. Um, I mean, this is another episode for another time. But basically, on that website, you go on the website, and it does a little vocab test for you. You have to click the words that you know uh, confidently, and it takes a couple of minutes. And then from that sample, they um, do a projection for how many words you probably know. So based on a little sample, they project that out to get an estimation of your uh, vocabulary size, okay? Generally speaking, native speakers know between 20,000 and 30,000 words, somewhere in that region for most native speakers. I got about 25,000 words in the test. So that puts me slap bang right in the middle of that uh, range. So I am completely and utterly normal, just in case you were wondering. Uh, and apparently, learners of English who get about 10,000 words can be considered near native, okay? And when I say native, I mean just, you know, um, someone who has uh, learned English as a first language in childhood and grown up in a predominantly English-speaking environment. That's what I mean by native. So learners of English can pretty much appear to be like a native with about 10,000 words. So there's probably quite a lot of words that are not really used that much, and, and 10,000 is, is a good amount. Above that, you know, you're talking into the sort of proficiency sort of area and beyond. <clears throat> um, apparently, you can basically get by, you can do pretty much everything you need to do with um, two or 3,000 words. But if you want to, you know, get things more sophisticated, 10,000 words is probably the point at which you could be considered sort of like proficient maybe or adva very advanced. So there you go, manylex.com. What am I going to do here? Because I've only done a, a small part of the comments and I'm already up to about an hour. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> One, two, three, four. Maybe I can do all of this in about four parts. So there are 95 pages. What's 95 divided by four? Oh dear. My maths uh, is not good enough to do that on the spot. 23.75. So when I get to, well, when I get to 24 pages, then I can, uh, then I can stop and um, carry on in the next part, okay? I don't want this to be too long. That would be ridiculous, wouldn't it? Aster LH said this, Bravo, Luke. Looking forward to your next podcast talking about the FIFA World Cup. Yeah, I don't know when I'm going to do that, but I'll do it soon. England are going to play France in a quarter final. I don't know when you're watching this, but today it's Tuesday, the 6th of December. And yeah, England, France in the quarter final. Whoa, that's a fantastic game. Anyway, Asta's question How many Asian countries have you been to? Okay, so obviously I've been to Japan, but I've also been to um, uh, Vietnam. I've been to Laos. I've been to Cambodia. I've been to Thailand. I've been to Indonesia. I've been to. Kuala, I mean, I've been to the airport in Kuala Lumpur, that's Malaysia, and I've been to the airport in Seoul, Incheon Airport. Does that count? Let's say it does. 
Okay, so Japan, Thailand, Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, South Korea, uh, Malaysia. I don't know if those two count. So it's either five or seven Asian, Asian countries, I think. Don't know if I've been to... Oh, India, does that count? Does that count as an Asian country, India? Because I've been there a few times. There you go. Jacob, or Jakub, said this. Hello, Luke. I really enjoyed your podcast about comedy TV series like Alan Partridge. However, I asked you, very politely, quite a long time ago, about the possibility of doing an episode, likely more than one, about Peep Show. I believe that we could all learn from Peep Show loads of useful British expressions and phrases which never occur in textbooks for students. Is there any chance that some comedy episodes are in the pipeline? Respect and best wishes from Poland. Peep Show. Yeah, I'd love to do that. I'd love to do a British comedy episode about Peep Show, and I must do that. So, yeah, God, it's another thing that's going to be added to the list. I've got a very long list of episodes to be done. So there you go. I'm adding it to the list as well. Uh, Peep Show. Great, great comedy show. Teacher Zdenek. This is Zdenek from Zdenek's English Podcast. His question was this. What is the hardest thing about doing the podcast? So I think the hardest thing about doing the podcast is... Taking an idea, like getting an idea and shaping that into the finished product. Going from the idea to the recording and then editing it down to the finished product. That can be very hard, depending on the episode. Rambling episodes are no problem in that regard. But I've got some episodes that are that can be really difficult. Like the one about, um, for example, uh, the one about uh, why British singers sing with, in American accents. So that was an idea. Like, why do British people sing with American accents? I thought, right, that's the idea. Now I need to do lots of research. So I had to do tons of research. I had to do loads of writing. Also, I had to pick out songs to demonstrate what I was talking about. And I decided to play them on the guitar and sing in American and British accents. So all of this stuff to create this whole thing, it was kind of like an essay, more than a podcast almost, with guitar demonstrations, that was extremely hard to put together. So shaping that idea, which I knew was an interesting idea, exploring why Brits sing in American accents, and then going through all of the reasons and demonstrating all of it with the guitar. So that's difficult. And I've got several other episodes like that in the pipeline, which um, are just a bit of a, a headache to put together. I've got one about a song, a song which contains lots of stories. And I wanted to, I wanted to explore the stories and, and tell the stories that are told in the song, explore the song lyrics, and then sing the song for you. And also do a parody version of it as well. Uh, so, but I mean, I just can't seem to get it together because there's too much preparation involved. So that's the thing. The whole process of shaping a complex idea into a finished uh, product. Stenic. Uh, Dimitri Obukov said this. Hi, Luke. I'm really into your podcasts and watch every single episode, no matter what the length or no matter what length it is. My favorite videos are about detective and horror quizzes slash stories. Are you planning to make the podcast? Are you planning to make mm, a podcast, meaning a podcast episode on this topic? Question mark. If so, I'm looking forward to seeing new episodes soon. Um, basically, detective uh, quizzes and stories. Yes, well, it's your lucky day, Dimitri, because um, last week I recorded three, count them, three detective stories, three murder mystery stories on the podcast. Uh, so there's three episodes with three different stories coming uh, to you soon, maybe after this one. Um, Cristiano Ronaldo. I don't know if it's the real Cristiano Ronaldo from football. But maybe it is. Maybe Cristiano listens to this podcast and he's decided to try and improve his English. Anyway, Cristiano Ronaldo said this. Hi, Luke. How's it going? First of all, thank you for teaching us. You're welcome. My question is, is it possible to speak like you if I only listen to your podcast? I mean, your intonation and your pronunciation. You speak very clearly. I like your speech. That is why I usually listen to your podcast. My name is Berit... <laughs> Berdiev Azamat from Kiva in Uzbekistan. Okay, not Christ not Cristiano Ronaldo at all. It's Azamat um, in Uzbekistan. So, um, if you just listen to the podcast, can you learn to speak like me? Uh, not just listening. Obviously, listening is really important because it kind of gives you the blueprint for what English sounds like. Like, here it is. You want to learn English? 
You want to learn to speak English? You must listen to a lot of it so that you know what it sounds like when it happens, right? Um, so, um, so that's good. But you also need to do other things. You need to practice, practice, practice. Speak a lot. Practice speaking after me. Repeat after me. Repeat, repeat, repeat. Shadowing, speaking at the same time as me, saying the same thing as me. Um, so all those things. Um, listen and repeat with a, with a script. So repeat what you hear and then check the script. Don't read the script while you are repeating. Just repeat what you hear and then check the script to see if you're correct. So lots of that focusing on the oral version of the language. Um, uh, study the phonemic script. Learn the phonemic script. Learn how to use it and then practice uh, transcribing words in and out of phonemic script. So going from phonemes to words, from words to phonemes, all of it. Check the Check that you, you've been transcribing them properly by using a dictionary. Um, use the BBC uh, Pronunciation Workshop, Tim's Pronunciation Workshop on the BBC, BBC Learning English. Uh, there are loads of lessons there that you can do. And practice speaking with other people. Try and speak as much as you possibly can on a regular basis so that you get used to expressing yourself uh, with your words in English. And all of those things together, I'm afraid, are the things that you need to keep doing as a process. Um, this comment from respected now the this is written in chinese characters but i um i google translated it and it translates as respected respect man so this is respected's comment hi luke i wonder what makes you an english teacher i'm a new listener since maybe three months ago and i enjoy your style a lot thanks anyway the, the since three months ago thing, it's a bit shaky whether this is correct, but I'm going to let it slide because I think it's all right because since and then a point in the past, three months ago is more or less a point in the past. So I'm going to let that one slide. That's good. So I wonder what makes you an English teacher. Uh, I don't know what makes me an English teacher. I suppose, A, the qualifications. I've got a CELTA and a DELTA. That's the two you know, the CELTA is the entry level qualification. And then the Delta is like the higher diploma in English language teaching to adults. That's the one that you, you get if you want to progress in the industry. And it makes you a super teacher, basically. Um, so I got that in 2006, blooming neck, over 15 years ago. Um, so that I'm qualified. And also the experience, you know, 20 years, 20 odd years as an English teacher at the coalface of teaching in the classroom, teaching directly with students for over 20 years, right? Full time, most of the time. That's a lot of hours of contact time teaching. Um, so that's it. That's probably what makes me a teacher. And also people call me teacher. So that must be something to do with it too. There you go. Respect, man. Cecilia DeMello. I'm probably pronouncing all your names wrong. But Cecilia wrote this. Hi, Luke. Thank you for teaching us. My question is, I don't have problems to understand you, but why is it so difficult for me to understand an American talking? Well, it's because they speak wrong, right? I mean, you know, they don't know how to speak. So obviously you're not going to understand them. I'm joking, uh, ladies and gents, just in case there was any doubts, I'm joking about that. Why is it that you don't understand Americans speaking, but you understand me? Well, maybe you're, maybe it's a question of familiarity. That's normally the reason. It's normally a question of familiarity. So if you listen to my podcast a lot, then you will be very familiar with my voice. And then when you hear Americans speaking, uh, you're less familiar with the little differences. And so it instantly seems more difficult. With time, you will discover that you will definitely understand them. But it's a question of familiarity first. Second thing is, what are you, where, where are you getting that English from? So you listen to me, it's a podcast. It's just me and my voice, probably on headphones. You can focus only on my voice and it's very clear. The sound quality is, is decent. And so you should be able to hear every single thing. If you're watching like Netflix or movies or something and you're listening to American English there, it's going to be much more difficult because there's lots of sound effects. There's music. The dialogue is mumbled and muffled. They don't speak clearly. It's a visual medium. And so the actual spoken English is secondary in many cases. And so it's much harder to hear and harder to understand. So maybe that's the reason. And maybe just British English is, is just better. It's just inherently, innately better, clearer and more effective for communication. Maybe that's it. 
uh, Vasky or Waski wrote this. What page number is this? 24. Okay, this is the last page for this part. My question, my first question is, what is the best moment in your childhood? And my second question is a bit personal, but anyway, how old is your daughter? How is she doing? So the best moment in my childhood, that's very difficult because honestly, hand on heart, thanks to my parents, I had a wonderful childhood with lots and lots and lots of happy moments, including things like going on holiday in Scotland and staying in a a kind of a wooden cabin with a big glass window on the front on the front of a of a of a lock right next to the ocean and watching the waves come in and watching the wildlife the birds feeding in the water watching otters playing going fishing and catching crabs and things um and staying in and in the warmth and playing board games that was pretty good but also there was one particular time when my dad came home from work and for some reason, he'd picked up a couple of Star Wars figures. And he came home from work and we were in the living room and he said, look, I've got you something. And it was my brother and me. And he got out of his bag, these two Star Wars figures. There was uh, Obi-Wan Kenobi for my brother and Luke Skywalker for me. Um, Luke Skywalker was wearing his orange X-Wing uh, fighter pilot outfit. That was a pretty good me- uh, moment. I still remember the smell of the Star Wars figures, which is kind of a strange thing. But they say that smell attaches to your memory much more closely than other things, other senses. But I still remember the smell of those Star Wars figures. And every now and then, I'll get another plastic product or some kind. And it's the same plastic as they used in the Star Wars figures. And it brings me right back to that day in the living room. So that's a pretty good moment. I could list others, but I won't. Uh, Vasky's second question... How's, how old is my daughter and how is she doing? So she's nearly five. She'll be five at the end of the month. And she's doing fine. She's doing great. She's learning to read. And she's got these little books. They're called Jolly Phonics. These, these Jolly Phonics readers. And every day at school with her teacher, the, uh, sorry, twice a week with her English speaking teacher, they practice working on different sounds and letter combinations and things. And then she comes home, she brings a little book home, and she reads the book. She reads it out loud. It's incredible. I mean, admittedly, the book is stuff like this. Cat sat. Cat sat. Um, just like basic sentences like cat sat, cat ran, you know. But still, she's reading, and she's playing the violin. Can you believe it? She actually plays the violin. I mean, pretty basic stuff. But still, she's doing fine. Thank you for asking. Um Okay, that's the end. That's the end of this part, listeners, viewers. Okay, that's the end of this part. I hope the video has turned out okay. I can't monitor the video while I'm recording it. So fingers crossed the video worked. If the video didn't work, this is just going to be audio only. But anyway, there you go. So this is going to be a big multi-part episode 800 celebration as I try and get through all these questions. And there are loads. There's nearly 100 pages of questions. Um, but I some of them will take me less time than others but it's going to be a bit of a marathon recording session for me but anyway as i said at the beginning the emphasis here is on chilling out relaxing and in just enjoying and just enjoying episode 800 without any worries okay thank you so much for watching thank you for listening as well thank you for supporting the podcast and i will speak to you in the next part but for now it's time to say goodbye bye 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 bye